one of the best guys in the entire business from the NFL Network, my friend, DJ Daniel Jeremiah, joins the Joel Class Show. DJ, what's up, buddy? I'm doing great, buddy. I'm looking forward to uh, our annual tradition, which is not only this visit that we have here, but it's us on a golf cart uh, getting ushered to the stage, the set. <laughs> And it and people if they you know there's lined up there's people there's a sea of humanity and they see a Joel and myself on there and we're in an intense conversation and I think they're probably guessing we're we're, we're going hey who do you think is going to be the first pick or the fifth pick and, and it really is just Joel I don't understand how your suit it looks so comfortable it's like it's a sweatsuit but yet it's really a suit like you can dress it up you can dress <laughs> it so down true. like it's tell so me true. about this thing when you travel does it wrinkle I mean these are these are the conversations we're having on that golf cart that is that is a hundred percent honesty right there DJ because our <laughs> entire conversation and last year it was like a 20 minute golf yeah, ride it was it a was long so, ride it was, a, it was, it was so I've, I know way too much about your wardrobe I know way too much <laughs> oh that's good stuff I absolutely love it um all right, DJ, let's get into it. You you have been busy, obviously, um, now coming out of the combine and getting prepped for the actual draft itself. We'll be live in, in um, Detroit. Rich Eisen will be hosting. We'll be there along with Charles Davis, uh, you and myself. You have your mock draft three out. You chose chaos, as you like to say um, mm -hmm. on Twitter. And I want to start there because I, I think that – this draft has probably more intrigue than a lot of the drafts that we've covered. And, and the reason is, is, and this is, we always talk about this, the, the volume of quarterbacks and, and the quarterbacks drive the conversation. You've been talking about it a lot. I've obviously been talking about it a lot. You chose chaos because these quarterbacks are going to drive chaos. Can you give us a sense based on the conversations that you're having around the league about how valuable they deem these five, six guys at the top of the draft in the quarterback room? Well, I, I think there's a lot of love for them. And I think there's a disconnect this year between, and just listening to the conversation that's taking place on like talk radio or different, different spots, they are pushing back on this narrative that we could see, you know, four quarterbacks go in the top 10. And they did, and I think the biggest reason, Joel, and and I'm curious to get your take on it, but I don't think that they can figure out JJ McCarthy. I think it 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 blows their minds. They don't get it. They say, "Well, look, I've watched Michigan play. You know, you were doing a bunch of those games. I mean, this is the biggest game of the week every week. Michigan goes on a run to a national championship, and I just never thought that that team ran through JJ McCarthy. And they can't wrap their minds around the fact that JJ McCarthy could be the fourth court fourth quarterback to go in the top ten. And I'm telling them, I'm like. Trust me, I talk to these teams all the time. I know what these coaches, I know what these general managers think of this guy. And the more you watch him, he's an acquired taste. The more you appreciate some of the things he does, especially when you get in third and seven plus when you watch that cut up. Um, and I, I I think that there's there's the need there. So you have demand and then we have legitimate supply that you can sell. So I, I think it's going to happen. I think we're going to see these guys go off the board quick. So DJ, the number is 16. I called 16 wow. Michigan games in the last three years. Since J.J. McCarthy stepped foot on their campus, I've I've watched him live 16 times, mm -hmm. which is an absurd amount, obviously. But it's a really interesting, I would say, perspective that I have because I saw him as this just wet behind the ears freshman that they were giving spot you know, time to. Uh, along with Cade McNamara. And then I saw this guy that eventually won the job, but was still very raw. And then this product that we saw towards the end of his last season as a starter. And, and I can tell you that he grew a lot from the pocket. I'm not telling you anything you didn't see on, on the tape, but I would echo exactly what you're talking about. What talk radio and what fans can't get over is what they see. And what they see is this Michigan team that was a bit of a machine. And they're going to run the football. Let's you know, for example, thirty-two straight times against Penn State. Now, granted, they threw a pass that ended up being a um, a pass interference, so that was negated. But they run the ball thirty-two times, and they're like, "Well, an elite quarterback would never have to run the ball thirty-two <laughs> times." Well, what they don't understand is they weren't going to block Chop Robinson. So in the first two series of the game, Chop Robinson runs around their their right tackle twice, and they just like abandoned. The but yeah. in the past, you don't game. need to. Why do but it? But it wasn't because of JJ. And, and this is what they can't understand. And then the last thing that I would say on, on JJ to have the talent that he did and, and to 
just do whatever the team wanted him to do to win. I was always most impressed with that because when I would t- talk to him, I would be like, Hey, like, do you ever like want to throw it more? And he would look at me dead in the eyes. And with all sincerity, he would just say, I will do whatever it takes to win. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. And if he said that to those teams, which I'm sure he did in, in Indianapolis or in any of their private meetings, I'm sure that they're seeing what I saw, which was a guy that was totally committed and really good. His ability level, I think, speaks for itself. Yeah, I I think this is a discussion that happens every year, though, Joel. Do you remember with, with Trayvon Walker and and trying to mm. tell people, like, this guy is going to go much higher than you think to the point where he went all the way up to the number one pick in the draft. Yeah. But there, but you look at the stat sheet and you go, guys, he only had four sacks. You know, what, what's the, I don't get it. This doesn't make sense to me. And I think that's, it's something I try and remind not only others, but I remind myself about this too, which is the, the job of these teams and, and our job, you know, to a lesser extent, when we are doing this, the draft evaluation and, and evaluating players, our job is not to evaluate performance. Our job is projection. Because if that were the case, if it was just based off performance, we could all print out the stat sheet and we would draft whoever had the most touchdown passes and whoever had the most sacks. But the job is to see how these players are going to be once they play really a completely different sport uh, in the NFL where things change. And I think with J.J. McCarthy, you look at him and say, he's got a live arm. He's incredibly smart. He's tough. He's athletic. He can move around like all those things. I don't need him to fill up a stat sheet to know that a lot of the things that he has in his toolbox uh, translate well to the next level. And I mean, that's just one of the quarterbacks. I know you started this with, with a broader discussion of the quarterback mm-hmm. class in general. No, it's, I'm but I think that's an example of it. I think yeah. that's an example of, of the disconnect a little bit there. Okay, so um, if you haven't seen uh, my mock draft 2.0, go check it out. It's on the show. Uh, DJ's got three of them out, 3.0. Go check that out. You can um, check out all of his stuff at Move the Sticks on Twitter. You can find uh, that, his podcast, Move the Sticks. Go listen to it. It's the best in the business. There's no doubt. DJ, you had all all four of the first p- uh, four picks going quarterback. So mm-hmm. I, would, I would love to get – and by the way, I had – Four of the first five, we both have the Vikings trading up. I traded them to five. You traded them all the way to four to take McCarthy. So we both have the Vikings taking McCarthy. Let's go above that, if you don't mind. I know that we're kind of going backwards a little bit, but the Vikings are clearly gearing up to make a move. I think that that's obvious. In my mind, the commanders and Patriots are sitting there and they can't move because they've got to take their quarterback. They can't trade out of that pick. And just, again, roll the dice on who's going to be taking snaps when they've got guys like Drake May and Jaden Daniels sitting in front of them. I Look, I'm with you on that. I've been saying that's what makes the most sense. But there's... um, Look, there's a lot of information out there when you study it. There's been a bunch of stuff said and reported over the last, really over the last couple of weeks of the failure of the top five quarterbacks, you know, top five pick quarterbacks over the last several years. The batting average has not been very high because the thought process well, they go to is bad teams. you're going to bad teams. So the, th- the thought there is, well, let's do what the Bears did. Let's try and trade down and make the roster better so that we do take the quarterback. We have the foundation in place. And my thing is the Bears... God bless them. They they picked the right trade partner because the Carolina Panthers had completely gutted their team, which then fetched them the first overall pick to then be able to take the quarterback here uh, where they are this year. I, I just feel like there's no guarantees you're going to be up there again as much as you'd like to you know, trade down and accumulate picks and build out the rest of your roster. There's no guarantee you're going to be employed long enough for that to happen, and there's no guarantee you're going to be in striking position to get a player of that talent. So even though the recent history isn't isn't kind, I, I would be surprised if those any of those top three teams got out of there. Um, there's been some talk about Drake May, and that's where I'll drive this, because no. I don't think that you and I would have a very interesting discussion about Caleb Williams. We both think he's a really great player. Yeah, Maybe it would be interesting, maybe not. I, think I didn't we, think he tackled very well. I mean, I didn't think he played very good defense. <laughs> well, I, true story, Joel. This dude, I... I, I I've gotten very disciplined in my old age now to the point where I don't, for the most part, I leave it, I leave it alone, but there's, there's definitely type it out and delete it moments. And that was one of them. When I posted two throws from the regular season game of Utah and SC from 22 yes, and I, I two plays, unbelievable plays from Caleb. 
Yeah. And the guy literally his I saw one of was, them you said like well you you talked about look at what happens when he has a number one wide receiver. Yeah. He's yes. third and 15 and he rips a dig oh, to Jordan Addison. It's such a good th- it's, it's such ridiculous. an amazing throw. Ridiculous. And then yes. he has another one he escapes out to the right, has enough awareness to know he's getting towards the line of scrimmage and just floats one just with unbelievable touch over the top uh for wins up being a big play. So I post these two plays and the response I get is yeah, and they lost that game. Couldn't beat Utah. And I I literally I started typing up 363 yards, five touchdown passes. He had like 50 yards rushing. Sorry, he lost 43 to 42. He should have tackled better. Like That's I don't right. know even what what do I what do you do with that? I I was I reserved enough. I did not I did not post it, but that was my thought. I my memory is so bad when I really want something. Who was the tight end that had like a million catches for Utah? It's like I'm sorry that oh, yeah. Caleb Kinc- Williams, uh, Kincaid, Kincaid, Kincaid. Yeah. Dalton Kincaid had, I think I'm I actually I was like 19 catches or something crazy. Like he that, had an amazing yeah. game, and it's like sorry Caleb Williams didn't defend the tight end better, <laughs> but you know uh, I digress. Um, yeah. I want to take it to Drake May because there's chatter. I hear the chatter about Drake May, and people are like oh, I don't know about Drake May. Let me just give you my thought on Drake May. Yeah. I saw him, I covered him live, and I'm always skewed by the games that I covered. Yeah, I've told you that before, right? Because yeah. I'm not I'm not trained like you are from a scout's perspective. I am swayed if I'm in the booth and I watch someone do something great. I'm like, okay, I'm in. And I covered the Holiday Bowl when he plays Oregon, and he made three or four throws in that game, eluding someone in a tight space in a phone booth. And then ripping something in 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 another you know phone booth, a dinner plate window down the field, down the middle of the field to make throws against what I know was a really good defense that Oregon had, and I'm just in. Like I think Drake May is any other year when Caleb Williams isn't the the consensus unanimous number one pick. I think Drake May is absolutely number one pick material. That's where I sit. Well, I mean, I just I think sometimes people think there's a perfect prospect or they think that all of the picture is going to be colored in. And that's not how this works. You have to take into account the surrounding. And I think with Drake and I would even put Caleb back into that conversation of the surrounding uh, cast that they had was such a drop off from what LSU had in place. So like we can get into that, that whole debate and that whole discussion there, but let's just look at the things that we know with Caleb and this or with, uh, with Drake. With Drake, I know size, that's irrefutable. He's got outstanding size. He's got a big-time arm, a live arm, that's irrefutable. He's an outstanding athlete, not only as a, you know, you can use him in design quarterback runs, you can move the pocket. He's got a creative gene to him to be able to make things happen. Like, those things are all irrefutable. And then when you talk to the folks at the school and you hear incredibly, incredibly bright, incredibly tough leader, I'm like, this is the foundation. Now, There's some footwork stuff that gets away from him at times. He's always under pressure. He tried to get a little too big at moments and dial that back. But I'm like, Joel, like if we're, if we're talking about the foundation of a successful quarterback, he has all of it. So now we've got to get the rest of it out of him and put the right pieces in place around him. And that's the, I mean, that's an easy one for me to bet on. And and you've been doing this a lot longer than I, I have not because of our age, but just because like I, I didn't do the draft for a long time. Um, I'm sure this happened at some point in your career, maybe maybe even as a scout. But I learned so much from poor opinions of of two guys specifically, and I've learned a lot. Herbert and Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. And coming out, I wanted to nitpick and I wanted to do all these things about it, and yet I could have cut and paste exactly what you just said about Drake May for those guys. The size, the live arm, the intelligence, all these things that are like, well, yeah, and I knew those, but I was like, well, his completion percentage and well, he's just not that accurate and this or that. And, and May is more accurate than both of those guys were at Oregon and, and Wyoming, respectively, at least in, in my estimation. I learned a lot from missing on those two prospects. I remember I said, I don't know if I would take a first round pick on Justin Herbert. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, that just like it lives on forever. Everyone, we've all, every, so, we've yes. all done this. Everybody's done this. You know, but I he was like a my lot 20th player. He was like my 20th player. I, I've watched every game he's played in the NFL. That was the, that's the, that's the sense of humor in this whole thing. 
is that I, you know, Justin Herbert, I, I saw the size, the, the arm strength, the athleticism, the intelligence, the toughness. I looked at all that and said, I don't know. He's a little bit robotic and they don't really right. push the ball down the field. Right. The Auburn game, the end of the game, he, he threw it out of the back of the end zone. You know, and it was like, that was a lesson. I'm with you. That was a good lesson for me of like, Hey, if, if all the foundational pieces are there, then what are we doing? Like, stop, just stop full stop. And that's, uh, so I'm with you on the, uh, you know, Herbert was the same thing for me and I get to, I get to watch him every single week and, and he makes a throw every week and I go, what, what a dummy. Yeah. What, what was what, I doing? What was I thinking? What was I thinking? Um, I want to stick with quarterbacks because I think that there's another, uh, really interesting one. Um, and I know we've talked about most of them. I mean, we could do this just on quarterbacks because we could sit here and talk about Jaden Daniels, but I want to, I want to first just throw it to you, Michael Penix. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Michael Penix? Huge arm. Um, it did not surprise me when I got a chance to see him live for the first time at the senior bowl that he has enormous hands because he throws the ball like somebody who has huge hands. Drive throws, he's outstanding. You know, driving the ball outside the numbers, deep balls over the top, he is unbelievable. And and it's just it's it's a different delivery, it's a different look because not only is he left-handed. But he's left-handed. He's high cut, right? So he's got long legs, short torso, and he's got a three-quarter delivery. So you all those things put together, it looks different. Like it's just, it's like it takes you a while. It's like you got to get recalibrated when you're watching him. But you can definitely see the ball jump out of his hands. And you know, if you want, if you want to fall in love with Penix, you watch the Texas game uh, and you watch it over and over and over again and see those throws that he made in that game and see some of the pocket movement stuff that you question. Uh, when you watch some of these other games, the durability, the injuries factor in 100%. The age, I don't really worry about. I think it's almost a good thing nowadays to have that number of starts under your belt. I love that he's had adversity. Um, I Look, I had him in this last mock draft. I mean, in my personal list, in my top 50 list, I have him more kind of right around that borderline one, two, like in that range. And then the mock draft, I had him going 13 to the Raiders because yeah. I'm looking at, at Aiden O'Connell and I'm looking at Gardner Minshew, and I'm sure you've probably called both of their games in college. I have. I have. The talent as a thrower between him and those two guys, it is not close. No. It's not. And I'm going to go one step further, and I just want I want your honest reaction to no. this. Okay. I love Michael Penix so much throwing the ball down the field. I love his timing and ability to control from the pocket so much. I love his ability to throw with leverage so much. I don't think that this gets talked about enough um, when we talk about quarterbacks is are you putting your wide receiver in a position to have better odds than the defensive back? How many times are you making your wide receiver catch a 48% ball versus a 52% ball? Right. And and that that's what I mean by leverage. And when I watch Penix throw the ball, and I'm talking about down the field, the ball is always opposite the defender. Mm-hmm. And and the wide receiver always is in a position where his odds are greater. And so from that point, I start thinking about the offenses and the play callers and the personnel in the NFL. And it's like, okay, if I wanted to pick one spot where I think he would immediately not only make them better, but flourish. I cannot stop thinking about Miami. Oh God. I cannot stop thinking about Miami. You're going to get, Oh man, the two of folks are coming after you. I know. And they have, and they have, because I think he's an upgrade. I think he's an immediate upgrade. There is not a doubt in my mind that he throws the ball better down the field and more accurately down the field and with more power and tempo and pace than Tua. Right now. And that doesn't mean that Tua doesn't have a spot in the league. Tua would be a lot better for Sean Payton, you know, in in a lot of respects because of what Sean Payton likes to do with more of a point guard style quarterback. But I just, I can't get this out of my head, this panics to Miami. I really can't. That's fun, man. I haven't heard that yet. So that's, uh, it's an interesting way that you put it because I don't think that anybody would argue with you in terms of being able to drive the ball and then to drive the ball over the top. Um, that Penix, you know, on an arm from an arm standpoint, that's not close. I would say how they've, and a lot of this is not necessarily. I would say the Mike McDaniel offense. I would say they've they've crafted an offense around Tua, RPO based slants, 
quick hitters. I think Tua's hands are quicker. Um, that's where I would give him the edge and all mm-hmm. the RPO stuff you're going to do. He's just he's just so quick with all that. Whereas Penix, I think, allows you to really, with the speed that they have, I think it would be less run after catch and would be more, we're just going to play on top of you. You know, yeah. We're going to get on top of you and make those. And then if you expand it, then we're going to bury you with 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 digs and in cuts and those things. But I think Tua, like his superpower to me is just the, is those. You know, I talked about when he was drafted, like as a blackjack dealer, like that's what he is. It is just it is just ride, rock, throw, and just just get the ball out as quick as you can and let those guys run with it. Um, but I think that's a, I would think it would be a different looking offense with Penix, and I think it would be a much more you know vertically dynamic offense. Thank you for watching the Joel Clashio YouTube channel. And if you like this clip, make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel. And you can stay up to date on all of my college football coverage.